Hi there everybody and welcome to This Month in Procurement, which is episode 268 of The Art of Procurement. I'm your host, Philip Eidson. I'm going to bring in my co-host for This Month in Procurement, Kelly Barner, in just a minute. But before I do, I want to thank Tradov for their support of Procurement Thought Leadership and for sponsoring this episode of Art of Procurement. So Tradov eliminates pain points between business buyers and sellers. So whether it's purchasing urgency, unaligned buying and selling processes, a lack of communication and transparency within their own teams, and difficulties discovering new suppliers. So one of the things that you can do with Tradov is build your own private network or community portal, and you can do that for free. So for example, you can create a private network within Tradov where your entire procurement team can share information, post thought leadership and start group discussions. So it's like a hybrid of LinkedIn, Slack and a wiki page that brings together all of your team's communications into one place. Now switch over to the public areas of Tradov and you'll join a community of over 250,000 buyers and sellers. So as a buyer, you can post your supply needs and Tradov will notify the best suited sellers of those services worldwide. So this gives buyers an opportunity to find new suppliers, to receive multiple proposals and become better informed on the market dynamics of the product or service that they are buying. Well, to join Tradov, to join for free, whether to create a private network for you and your team or to discover new suppliers for your next sourcing event, just go to artofprocurement.com slash Tradov. That's artofprocurement.com slash Tradov. Okay, so Kelly has been waiting patiently on the other side of the line. Uh, we've had the summer off from this month in procurement. So thanks for joining me again. Hi, Phil. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, how was your summer then? It was fast. Yeah. You know, it's funny for, for anybody that I talk to or even any of the calls I've had in, let's say, the last week or so, the big co topic of conversation for anyone that works independently, works out of a home office is, when is the first day of school in your <laughs> district? <laughs> yeah. uh, so things are very slowly returning back to normal, but it was, a, it was a great summer. Lots of beach, lots of ice cream, lots of fun. Great. And a big celebration when your kids got the school bus last week and you could get your head down and get some work done. Exactly. And realized this list I'd been building all summer of things I needed to do was actually time to start working on it. Yeah. Well, we ended up going back to the UK and it's, it's probably the longest that I've taken out um, since I started the business oh, four years ago. So we saw some family, some friends. I uh, got to see some clients in the UK too, which was great. Um, and it was probably some pretty welcome downtime, I would say. But you know, the, the flip side of that is that now I'm struggling to catch back up on email <laughs> um, you know, kind of inbox out of control, which, you know, is nothing new. And I'm sure everybody who's listening has exactly the same problem, but uh, trying to figure out how can I, uh, yeah, get things a little bit back under control from the email perspective. How do you do it? You got any tips for me? Well, being OCD helps, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you see the new emails come in. Um, I'm sort of an obsessive list maker. So even when I'm on vacation, it's so easy for those little emails that come in with small tasks, like people checking in or mm -hmm. just following up with the detail to get kind of lost in the shuffle. Um, I'm, I'm horrible about keeping my inbox clean, but I'm wonderful about writing down the things I need to yeah. do. So, so I think that would be my, ignore the fact that it says 2,900 emails <laughs> on my, my little iPhone app. Um, but look at the to-do list. That's, that would be my tip for anybody trying to get back to inbox control. Yeah. I need to get back to an, to a, uh, a to-do list. You've helped me from time to time and, <laughs> uh, you know, it's not necessarily a habit that's stuck yet. So I think I need to print out some to-do list, uh, templates and get started. You know, visit with the task doctor. <laughs> I know. So, uh, just a review of the format, just to remind the listeners, we, we actually haven't done this for uh, a few months over summer. So basically we'll have a little bit of a discussion on previous pods that have been published on the show in the last month. Um, we'll then go into a specific topic, you know, something that we want to share, um, for, you know, this month, just something that's been on our minds, something that perhaps we have an opinion on or, uh, something that has been close to us, you know, based on the work that we've been doing recently. And then what we have coming up next month, um, let's go into this month on the pod. And I, I wonder, Kelly, it's always interesting to get your perspective because you're listening. You're not, uh, you know, kind of involved in the, the interview itself. So you, you get the listener experience. That the first pod that we had was, um, where did the money go? Bridging the procurement and finance gap with Dana Small. Uh, what were your takeaways from that pod? 
So I think the the big thing about your your conversation with Dana, and for anybody who doesn't know her, she's a unique animal in in several ways. Um, I think the biggest way in which she's a unique animal, she is a a practitioner, right? She's yeah. working in procurement, and yet she's an open blogger. So she's not blogging under a pseudonym. She's not blogging sort of at the direction of her company's marketing team. She's really blogging kind of in the tradition that blogging was started in, at least from a business perspective. This is what happened at work today. This is what I'm dealing with right now. And I've, I've asked her at times, you know, anybody in procurement is always concerned. Like if I say too much, then my suppliers will have Mm -hmm. a leg up. And her take is like, you know what? I'm above board and anything I say on the blog, I would say right to my supplier's face or I would say to my colleagues' faces. So why not share that with everybody? So if you've not checked out the Ms. Category Management blog, I would highly, I would highly recommend it. Yeah. Um, but the other thing, and, and this is actually what brings us back to that title of where did the money go, is that she was originally working in part of finance and she started to get frustrated because by the time finance would realize there was an efficiency opportunity, it was, it was because it was broken. It was too late to do anything about it. And so Dana said, you know, enough of this. I'm tired of watching the broken things go by. I'm going to go pursue a career in strategic sourcing. Bless her heart. You know? Hmm. Um, so I think, I think that's one of the things that makes her unique to listen to. Um, and, and Phil, it's interesting because you've worked with a number of different functions. And you've also been working as a practitioner and then spent time covering the space. Which transition or which divide do you think would be harder for for you to cross? The notion of moving from a finance-oriented role to a strategic sourcing role or the idea of being a practitioner, but then also speaking out loud about your experiences and being a blogger. Yeah, it's, it's it, you know, one I commend Dana for doing that because, you know, like you said before, we, we often have this, it's kind of something that's built into us. And perhaps this is mm. one of Dana's advantages of coming from finance and not starting in procurement, um, that she wasn't necessarily brainwashed to some degree into, oh, yeah. you know, not into thinking that information is power. Um, because I think that's what stops us sometimes. What's really, what I love about Dana and doing what she does is the fact that there's, you know, there's few people who are offering opinions about the procurement space who are actually working in procurement, you know, to say that, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of folks who have never worked in procurement that have an that's opinion right. on procurement. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, you know, how can those... Uh, how can those people really empathize with a procurement professional uh, and know what it's really like? And that's one of the great things about Dana is she knows what it's like because she's doing it every single day while that's she's talking right. about it. Um, you know, and all credit to her for doing it. Now, in terms of transitioning from another profession into procurement, I've often wondered, you know, I've always been in procurement and sometimes I think that's a positive and sometimes I think that's a negative. Mm. You know, throughout my career, I've tried within that boundary of procurement to touch every single you know corner of the procurement globe that I could possibly touch from a responsibility perspective, um, because I think it's really dangerous to, to focus on one specific thing and, and only be able to do one specific thing. Um, you know, I think coming from outside helps give people a different mindset. So that, that's I one think of the it positives, does too. you know, of coming yeah. from outside. And it's interesting too, because her, her very, this is maybe the part, in, in thinking about Dana's professional traits, that's, I think, the most finance. So she's very straightforward. And and I think having that mindset, even more than the experience in finance, actually has wide-ranging implications for her work in procurement. Mm-hmm. Uh, because even in a, in a LinkedIn discussion with Dana this week, completely unrelated to her podcast, I was joking and making the confession that I despise negotiating. Right. It's, I can do it. It is fine. I'm successful and all that, but I don't love it. It's not my favorite part of the job. And Dana immediately responded. I think it was when, within seconds of me putting the post up. And she was like, you have to be kidding me. That's my favorite part. Right. And, and I found it interesting because I think too, this notion that, I don't love sort of the conflict back and forth game playing aspect of, of negotiation. That's not my favorite, 
But Dana's attitude is what conflict, what back and forth, what game playing. I'm just going to tell you what I want, what I need, mm-hmm. what I see. And then you're going to do your best to either tell me how you can meet that or make other suggestions. And I think it's looking at the world that way really does make it easier and make her more successful. So she's a, she's a voice that we are very lucky to have as part of the profession. Yeah. You know, it's funny you say about negotiation. I kind of, I've, I've never had a problem with negotiation in a corporate environment. Um, you know, but when it's yourself, like we, this weekend, our car broke down. So we had to go and buy a new car. You know, I would be ashamed of myself as a professional for the lack of negotiation (laughs) I did, you know, when buying the car, you know, you sit down like, okay, those are the numbers. Okay. I guess I'll do it. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas if, uh, you know, put me in a professional context, I would have as much data as you could possibly fit into the biggest Excel spreadsheet you've ever seen with every single like uh, argument and counterpoint, uh, to every position that's put from the other side of the table, um, and have no problem in doing that. And, you know, sometimes the brinkmanship that comes with that. But in a in a personal environment, I'm with you. Like I don't want the conflict, um, <laughs> and so I'll just kind of take what I'm <laughs> given. Uh, which you know, <laughs> I guess that's just the way it is. But um, and the other thing that I I did take from the conversation with Dana was, um, and something we lose sight of sometimes is you know in her role in finance, at least in my personal experience, you know I would often see finance as being the adversary. You know, who are these finance people trying to negotiate down the savings that I'm trying to claim? Because finance only came in at the end when I said, you know, here's a million dollars of savings and they're trying to poke holes in it. Um, Exactly. And, you know, obviously that's not the mindset to have because that's uh, that's going to give you, again, an adversarial relationship. And it's going to there'll be so little trust that they're they're looking to poke holes in your argument because they don't trust your number. Um, so there's a big element of this of, you know, how can you build closer relationships with your finance team, uh, bring them along for the ride. Um, and so when they, for example, are validating your savings numbers, you know, they know exactly where it came from because they were as That's part right. of the project as you could possibly make them, you know, based on, of course, their availability. But I think that's something that's really important. Absolutely. Um, and then the, the next podcast we had this month is actually on a completely different topic. Uh, you talk to Ellen Lafitte, uh, who's a specialist in managing consulting services spend. Yeah. Talk about an amorphous, difficult bucket of, of professional services spend to have to manage. Um, but, but she's completely at home in that realm. Obviously, it's her, her area of specialization. And the perspective that she brought to it, I think, is really interesting because it wasn't that she was saying – you need to source consulting services spend completely different from how you manage anything else. She was saying it's about putting procurement's emphasis in different parts of the process. So if you visualize that, you know, whether you have six or eight, you know, whatever your sourcing process step process happens to be, um, instead of putting equal emphasis on all six or instead of putting the most emphasis on strategic sourcing, for instance, um, or the negotiation step or the RFP, she's saying really where procurement can provide the biggest value is in making sure that the scope is defined, calling out and articulating objectives and milestones, making sure everyone is clear on deliverables and deadlines. Um, and that's really the earlier stages. If, if you compare it to a material sourcing project, it's really more like spec definition, mm-hmm. right? Is, is where she's saying we need to spend more time. And, and you and I both spend time in, in consulting. So I found that interesting to hear. Yes. Um, you know, and I think it, it's, it transcends consulting services as well. Um, it was, you know, it's often seen as a difficult category. So I really, really enjoyed my mm-hmm. conversation with Ellen because, um, you sometimes it's one of those where you feel like the deal is done before it gets to you. And I say yes. that having been a buyer for consulting, you know, usually there will be a, um, a four page engagement letter that lands on your desk from, you know, insert um, large consulting house here, you know, whoever it happens to be that's laid out, you know, all the ins and outs of this consulting deal and how you're going to be paying them half a million dollars a month for their five people. Um, and you know, you've got an executive who's looking for you just to, to sign the contract. And that's often how we get involved in, in consulting. Um, yeah. so it's a lot of the, uh, a lot of the focus was on, 
um, well, we did talk about rates and the, what the market looks like. It was, yeah. of course, about the early engagement and how, you know, like one of the things that, that, that I would do when I did consulting was, um, or when I had that category was look to, you know, how can you split up the scope so that, yes, if you have strategic and operational work, you're actually separating that into different scopes. Mm -hmm. So you're bidding out the strategic work um, and you're bidding out the, the execution, you know, you may, it may be suitable that you go to different firms to do those two different things True. rather than paying, you know, a, a top two strategy house to do essentially execution work. So lots and of tips and, and strategies and tactics that we can use to, to help manage cost while not, um, going away from the outcomes that obviously someone's trying to deliver when they engage a consultant. No, absolutely. And, and it's funny because one of the things that I had written down in listening to the podcast after the fact, I think this is actually a, a piece of advice that procurement can apply almost anywhere, is that Ellen pointed out that procurement needs to be, and I'll do air quotes, so if you're listening, <laughs> do them with me, you need to be tight on what is needed but flexible about the approach. Mm -hmm. And I love that thought. And, and it validates what you're saying about feeling like the deal is done before it gets to you. Because if there's something to put on paper, it's probably the scope, the objectives, the milestones, the deliverables, and the deadlines. So if all of that is already defined before it gets to procurement's desk, there really isn't anything left to be done because that's the piece that needs to be tightened that's the piece where really the value comes into play and then really how it's carried out certainly that does come down to which firms do you work with for which parts of the execution or how is the billing model going to work um what will be the the milestones that trigger payment um, but the fact of the matter is the majority of procurement's opportunity to positively affect the project happens before that paper is put together. Yeah, it's, it's something that's interesting. You're now selling consulting services as well. So, um, you know, those who who get the most success out of working with consultants, I'd say, I, I want to say typically because I don't believe anything is ever black and white. Um, they allow the consultant to drive the process to get the outcome that they want to get, you know, when they're buying that consultant. Uh, those who fail or who have bigger challenges are those that dictate the process. So they what they say, I want an outcome, but they tell the consultant, this is how you're going to achieve it. Um, yes. And that's one of the problems. I think that's where the kind of the tightness and the flexibility come from as well is be flexible in letting your consultant tell you how you, how they're going to help you get the outcome you want to see. Right. And uh, we don't talk about it this way, but consulting services or professional services, right? It, it really is outsourcing, right. you know, and it's, it's funny because this is one of those things that now we're thinking about in the context of consulting, but it's, it's something that's not new because it's something that goes back to what Kate Fantastic has discussed for a long time uh, about, you know, you make all this effort to find the very best service provider in the world and then you tell them what to do. Right. You know, you brought them in because you don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Tell them your objectives. Tell them what you need to achieve, bigger picture, and let them worry about the execution. Otherwise, you drive the value out. Yeah, there was one other like nugget that I wanted to bring out as well from the, the conversation with Ellen. And, and she was talking about it, obviously, from a perspective of buying consulting. We we're talking about rates um, mm -hmm. in the consulting space. And, you know, she was saying that, um, you know, those uh, consultants – who are able to demonstrate that their work impacts top line growth command far greater pricing power than those who essentially are demonstrating the value they impact um, touches bottom line, mm. essentially uh, efficiencies. And it was really interesting for me as I think about that in the context of procurement and our value position and wanting, you know, this desire to feel wanted uh, that we all ha have, which, you know, <laughs> we talk all the time about, you know, it's on us to develop a compelling enough value proposition for people to want to work with us. But, you know, you see that that those huge consulting deals are going to firms who are driving growth, not um, cutting costs. And so does that say something about our positioning and how are we going to get, um, you know, the opportunity to get a greater investment in our profession if we start focusing more 
on how can we support growth rather than how are we um, essentially just managing costs. And I say just, I don't mean just, but you know, it's, it's that whole top line versus bottom line. And that was something that was interesting as I pulled out because the context wasn't procurement, the context was consultants. But to me, it's kind of exactly the same challenge that we face in procurement because we're seen as the bottom line folks rather than helping the top line. No, I, I think it's a terrific point. And it, one of the challenges that it leaves us with is uh, especially if you're working, you know, big four, big five consulting, I think there's a pre-existing notion that, of course, they're going to impact the top line. They're all wearing blue shirts and dockers. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't bring in a fleet of, of guys all wearing the same thing and they don't impact the top line, right? So there's there's always already kind of that that idea there, whereas procurement is so firmly associated with the bottom line that we need to say, yes, yes, but also. And I think it's a harder argument to make because the presumption does not exist that, well, yes, of course, procurement is going to affect the top line. And yet, why not? Right. I mean, if especially as we get into direct spend, as we get into professional services, I mean, if you look at it Conversely, if we do a bad job, if we select a bad provider, is that going to affect the top line? Oh, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. it most definitely is. So why isn't us doing a good job going to positively impact the top line? Unfortunately, that's a, a conversation that we have to keep having internally. Yeah, and it's obviously different in the culture of different organizations. But, you know, the vast majority of stakeholders who we support are doing things to, to support growth. Um, and, and our work impacts their ability to do that, whether it's reinvestment, um, whether it is allowing funds to move from one area of the business to another area of the business into R and D, whether it's to help them acquire new customers because we're helping them from a marketing perspective, right. uh, you know, with a new marketing provider, there's so many ways that we can connect what we do with growth. And I'm just not sure that we think about it in that way. So, you know, while I don't have a silver bullet of this is the metric to use, you know, I think that the more we can communicate about the support we give our stakeholders in growing the business um, will help us to start repositioning kind of the impact of what we do beyond just cost savings. Agreed. And and if you do figure out that silver bullet, you're yeah. going to let us know, right? You're I not going to keep that to yourself. Yeah, I'm going to hide it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so let's then transition and talk about the, the next conversation this month. Uh, you spoke to Jason Camerata at MDC Partners, yeah. um, and he was taking on uh, a, a topic that I think in some ways goes back to what we discussed about with Dana, but is certainly prevalent in any of the conversations that procurement has internally or, or externally, is this notion that good, and again, back with the air quotes, good conflict is not only necessary, it's it's sort of the opportunity to create value. Mm -hmm. And when I was listening to him talk, I was realizing that initially hearing him say, you know, conflict can be good, conflict gives us the opportunity to do this or that, or conflict means the following. I was very focused on, yes, but you said conflict, you know, it conflict is bad. You mm -hmm. maybe for you, Jason, maybe you're good with this, but no, no conflict, all the rest of us, we don't like it. But then he made a really interesting point and he said, conflict is proof or evidence that there are diverse opinions at play. And that completely changed the way I actually had to back up like, mm -hmm. okay, now that I have this idea in my mind, I need to back up and listen to this again, because if there isn't conflict, it does mean that everyone's in agreement. And while that feels nice, right. Mm -hmm. To all be in agreement, nothing different is going to be accomplished under those circumstances. Um, I don't know if that struck you in the conversation as well, or if you were already maybe further down the road than I am on, on the idea of conflict, but that was a huge shift in thinking for me that came out of that podcast. Yeah. You know, I wonder about conflict as well. If there's no conflict, it can obviously mean that everybody's happy. It could also mean that nobody cares. So they don't care yes. enough to create conflict. So you're so, you know, irrelevant that your opinion doesn't matter. You know, it does it, ma it matters so little, I'm not going to argue it. And so to me, this is a lot around influence and persuasion, mm. you know, c conflict, conflict is good. If, um, you know, we have the skills and ability to drive compromise. Um, and those are obviously really, really important procurement skill sets. Uh, when we start talking about softer skills is that yeah. influence is that persuasion, because then that allows us to still, um, enable the organization to take action, even where conflict exists. 
Well, and culturally speaking, especially for anybody in a leadership position, you know, certainly there's the possibility that everyone is so apathetic. They're just, you know, going about their tasks and waiting for it to be five o'clock. But the other possibility is you may have a culture where people are afraid to disagree mm -hmm. because it may negatively impact their project assignments, their, their career progression, you know, what, you know, where, when they're invited to go to lunch, um, you need to make sure that the environment exists. And obviously there needs to be boundaries, right? You don't go into a, a meeting where you're presenting recommendations to the executive team and you have like, you know, P on number four on the left disagreeing <laughs> yeah. with, with the team's recommendations. There's a time and place for everything. But if people don't feel like there's a, a safe space to collaborate, if people don't feel like it's acceptable to, even if it's not disagree, question an assertion that someone else has made. I think the earlier those points get fleshed out and discussed, and maybe you go back to the original point and present it differently, or maybe you take a different path forward entirely, but investing in a culture where you say to people, it's ridiculous for us to all think in lockstep because then only one of us is needed. Mm -hmm. You know, diver our strength is in our diversity. And if you have a background experience, or if you read something in the newspaper, or if you overheard something in the elevator, and it allows you to bring a completely different perspective to this that maybe changes the course of the project, that's important to speak up and share. So then the last podcast that we had in the month of August, um, you spoke to John Hansen, and as always, he has interesting insights that put sort of a twist on the big topics. Yeah. You know, we're, we're accustomed to talking about digital transformation. It's, it's nothing new. Um, but he's really made the point based on some, some research and some executive level conversations that he's had that 70% of any organization's digital transformation activity has to pass through procurement and the supply chain. So he's not just talking about procurement transformation or digital transformation that is specific to procurement. He's talking about all enterprise digital transformation. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of it has to go through procurement, but, and this is, this is the real John piece, but in order for procurement to seize that opportunity and for the enterprise to be successful, we have to step out of our traditional roles and start doing things differently and handling the unknowns that come with digitization differently. Um, I'd be interested in, in your thoughts on that. Cause also you talk to a lot of executive yeah. level folks about their transformation journeys. Is that something, is that number a surprise to you? Does it resonate with what you feel like you've heard? Yeah. It, it doesn't surprise me. And the reason why it doesn't surprise me is because at the end of the day, digital transformation is coming from outside the organization. And when I say that, I mean, it's been enabled by tools, mm -hmm. um, soft, whether it's software, whether it's a bot, um, you know, whether it's being supported by consultants who are specialists in, in transformation services around various different parts of the organization, all that intelligence, well, I say, all. Oh, that's not fair. A, a lot of the insights, um, a lot of the execution work and the software itself comes from the outside. And of course, yeah. you know, who's the organizational interface for outside providers? Well, if we do our job right, that's us. So, you know, that to right. me, that puts, that provides us the, the, the platform to be at the heart of so many of the decisions which are driving, you know, an enterprise digital transformation. Ultimately, it's not just digi digital, digital transformation is just a tool, you know, it's just absolutely, a you know, it's enterprise transformation. You know, how a company looks, feels, works is driven by outside providers. And, and so it's a, a, a tremendous opportunity. You know, that's kind of why I thought from a title perspective of that, you know, why digital yeah. transformation puts procurement at the heart of the enterprise, because it gives us that opportunity. And there's a but, you know, are we positioned to take advantage of that? And Absolutely. Some organizations are and some organizations aren't. And a lot of what John talked about are some of the skills that we need to focus on so that we can take advantage of that opportunity. So the question becomes not necessarily is procurement positioned to, right? Mm -hmm. It becomes, 
are we as procurement positioning ourselves? Yeah. Because if we can identify those skills, right, and they're going to be different by by industry and, and organization and procurement team, if we can identify those skills, whether it's on a group level with investments in learning and development, or whether it's on an individual level where people identify a need and go seek out a way to develop their skill in a specific area, we can be in charge of putting ourselves at the heart of these transformation yeah. efforts because we have the power to gain the skills and make the change. Yeah. I mean, we have to be proactive, you know, yes. and very few organization, very few parts of the business are going to come to us and ask for help, except mm -hmm. for in those companies where procurement has a fantastic reputation, where you have uh, in those organizations where there's a specific and particularly strong bond between an executive stakeholder and a uh, procurement professional, you yeah. know, a buyer or a CPO or a category lead, you know, you name it, but where uh, um, that relationship exists. If that doesn't exist, we're not going to have the organization coming and saying, hey, procurement, can you help me transform? No, it's not absolutely. even in the mindset. Um, and so that means that it's not something that you can just switch on. It's something that is going to take time. Uh, and we, being proactive, we're going to get a lot of knockbacks. Um, for me, you know, it's what's really, what will really help us is showing up with insight. You know, one of the things that John talked about that, again, I see all the time because I, I've actually been working on, um, you know, looking at industry publications um, for functions outside of procurement to understand what the challenges are of the CIO and the chief mm -hmm. HR officer and the chief privacy officer and, you know, you name it, chief marketing officer. Uh, because we all think of procurement's challenges in a bubble. And when you broaden that perspective, you see that every single one of the C-suite has exactly the same risks and fears and the unknown of what is digitization going to do to their area of the business. So nobody knows. You know, it's not like they have, um, you know, fully brought, built out strategies for digital technology that we don't That's have right. in procurement. Everyone's figuring this up, on the, uh, you know, as they go. Um, and so having insights more often than not is going to be valued at least in, st in terms of starting to demonstrate mm -hmm. that you do have a role to play in helping your stakeholder in their transformation journey. And remembering that all the functions are dealing with the same challenges also can help us off of our sometimes defensive position mm -hmm. where we feel like, you know, we're fighting for a seat, we're fighting for a voice, we're fighting to be heard. No, no. Everyone is dealing with the same thing. Just approach it on level footing right. because everyone understands. Yeah, no, absolutely. So then speaking of digital transformation, um, I understand one of the things that you've been working on is technology implementation turnaround specifically, sort of within this larger environment of, of digital transformation. Um, what's been some of your work there over the summer? Yeah, so we have um, been uh, fortunate to have the opportunity to work with a, a few companies who are on their own digital transformation journey. And what what you know i certainly see is that as organizations who have um a technology footprint you know when it comes to procurement uh, perhaps it's uh, only covering the uh, the p2p process so you know basically going for purchase uh, requisition through to purchase order um you know others it's a little bit broader than that uh, what's interesting to me is seeing how um technological launches typically they fail for a couple of reasons, you know, what I uh, what I see. One is that they're not configured correctly. And when I say correctly, I mean in line with the needs of the business. Mm -hmm. So you have a solution that's perhaps put out there. It's, it's out of the box. You kind of make some assumptions about what it's going to do and what it's not going to do. You get some basic business requirements, but it's, it's more of a press green, get it out there. Um, and uh, in some cases, just you know, assume it's going to work and then you start to have problems popping up all over the place. So there is some configuration element of it. But to me, a bigger piece that I continue to see is change management. Yeah. You know, it's, it's it, how are you going to bring the organization? And I say the organization broadly, you know, those users who you want to engage in using the technology, how are you going to bring them along for the ride? Um, how are you going to build their requirements into the configuration of the tool, but how are you going to communicate your progress? How are you going to train them? Training is such a big thing in terms of adoption. And yet, um, you know, a lot of organizations will maybe put out one or two training sessions and invite everybody to come. And 
you know, most of the people who are engaging in these technologies, whether it's a buyer who's doing a, uh, you know, using a SOS to contract platform to do an RFP or whether it's a stakeholder who's entering a requisition and watching the requisition go through the approval to PO process, most people only use technology periodically. And so you give them a, um, some quick training yeah. and they forget, you know, they forget how to do it. They forget they'll do one, one step wrong because they can't remember which steps to take. And, right. and then that becomes a whole world of frustration for them. And with frustration, then they give up on it. Um, and I see that so many times where people not long into an, an implementation just give up on it because they it, it's not because it's not that the tool isn't fit for purpose. Mm. It's because people don't necessarily know how to um, most effectively use it. Well, and this is one of those areas, and and I was even thinking about this because I've I've spent my own time doing, you know, whether implementation support or or project design, and I think, you know, I don't think most people would necessarily make this case out loud, but there's sort of an assumption that implementation is like a cousin of transformation, and it's really not even mm-hmm. close. They like one has nothing to do with the other. In order to transform, you don't have to implement. Implementation does not lead to transformation. And the fact of the matter is that break, I think, creates an expectation that puts too much pressure on technology to drive change when, in fact, it doesn't matter if it's P2P, it doesn't matter if it's a CRM, it doesn't matter if it's an ERP solution. At the end of the day, even digital change, digital transformation has to be led by people. Yeah. And whether it's users, the team rolling it out, communication, selecting the platform, Digital is not a result of technology. It still has to be people that ultimately make it happen Um, and people that are very well connected within the organization. You can't stay holed up in a conference room and have a successful implementation. You have to be out and about and talking to people and present and listening for problems and speaking the right words that people need to hear. It's a very, it's a very human thing, this digital transformation. Yeah. I know it's something that you wrote about, you know, getting out of the office. I mean, what was it that inspired that? Is that some of your experiences? Cause I know you were heavily involved in um, digital transformations when you were on the consulting side of the house. It was, and it was funny because um, I was I was in consulting and I wasn't dedicated to implementation. Mm-hmm. That was like a separate team. But I think the time when I was working, so let's say it was like 2003, 2006, somewhere in, in that window when I was pr- primarily focused on this work, the, the idea was really starting to expand that you can't just roll out the solution. And so yeah, okay, let's implement e-sourcing or whatever it is. And then the procurement team will roll it out internally. But in most cases, they weren't equipped and they weren't positioned to do that change management work. And so uh, we were figuring out that you really need to do a program redesign, whether it's really in-depth or whether it's just a a change adjustment. There's a much bigger effort that needs to go on and so mm-hmm. nobody was talking about transformation at the time. That wasn't the the phrase du jour, yeah. but we were still doing the work. It was about understanding that email processes need to change and expectations need to change. And you need to get out and, and even at the very early stages where traditionally an implementation session would have been procurement sitting around a conference table with somebody from the solution provider, walking them through a spreadsheet or going through a little checklist. And how do you, Oh, what should the email say that system notifications come out from that? It's much bigger than that. Even parts of that process have to involve either stakeholders of the output of the solution or the users of the solution, no matter where they're working yeah. from. And so the more expansive we can be about that, the better. Um, and that's why I had said, yeah, you have to take the implementation out of the conference room. It's not a meeting based project. Mm-hmm. It's a people based project. Yeah. And, and just, you know, ensuring that when you're building your project plans, that you're, you're building that into it, um, you know, and actually acting on it because at the end of the day, you know, when you make this, when you make these implementations real, you do need detailed implementation plans and project plans and work streams and all those things. Um, but oftentimes those work streams focus on configuration yes. um, and user acceptance testings and getting sign offs and things like that, but they don't take account of 
the the whole like I say the change management of how you're going to bring the stakeholders along with you how you, you know building focus groups in there um, ensuring that you have regular communications uh, feedback loops uh, you know taking feedbacks on features um, bringing in as as broad a a, a, um, a cross section of employees as you can into testing so they feel mm-hmm. like they've been involved in the process. And, and let's face it, that takes time. Yeah, because right, it, and it does, you know, because you got to coordinate calendars and yes. there's lots of different complexities of getting people in the same place together. So it may push out your implementation timeline, but it's really valuable when it comes it to is. actually hitting the go button because you feel like everybody's in it together. Exactly. Um, I mean, I know from my, and it's not one of these things that's easy. That's why I think why I say it's going to be really planned and structured in that way because. You know, I can't tell you in our business, you know, how many times you go and buy a, a, a fancy new toy, uh, which will be some SaaS product of some sort that is going to revolutionize how we, uh, we do marketing or revolutionize how we're going to do, you know, you name it. Yeah. Um, and it sits there unused because um, we never really had the commitment to build it into the, to the way that we work and change the way that we work around it. So absolutely. Um, so, yeah, same same thing, bigger scale and scope, obviously, from a um a procurement tech implementation perspective but same principles so as we as we kind of start to wrap this month in procurement let's take a little look ahead at what we have coming up um next week and and this is funny i i laugh to myself as i (laughs) as i type this uh so next week we have joe pastiglione the cpo of the nba or if you want the long version the chief procurement officer of the national basketball association (laughs) talk about two three letter acronyms that save a lot of time um not to tease you on this, Phil, I, I know you're big into your into your British sports, but talking to the head of the NBA about cricket doesn't really make sense. You, you know, um, I think I may have recorded this podcast with Joe the day after we won the Cricket World Cup. Oh, so, well, that helps. You know, um, I think we were on a little bit of a high then. And, you know, on that note, I'm actually proud to say my two young kids got the bug when we're in England. So we now get lots of weird looks from our neighbors here in Florida whenever we pull out the new cricket set and get the wickets set up but you know i'm <laughs> i'm on um i think i'm on plan for the, my oldest you know being in the u.s cricket team by the time is eight years old by virtue of the fact that he can hold a cricket bat so and yeah. no one else knows what it exactly. is everyone else is like what's wrong with your croquet set <laughs> exactly <laughs> Uh, no, but, and surprisingly you would think Joe, not that this is necessarily a fair assumption, but okay. Like big, huge sports association, right. A, you know, maybe aggressive, energetic kind of company culture. No, no. Joe talks to you about, uh, empowerment and emotional intelligence. Mm-hmm. I mean, those are capabilities that we don't find often enough anywhere, but certainly not in procurement. And I wouldn't necessarily have expected to find them in a, in a sports driven organization. So that's sort of an interesting piece of yeah, context. You're kind of in a, in a competitive environment. Uh, you, uh, I love this conversation. I can't wait to share it um, because it is all about the, the managing the softer side. You know, one of the things that Joe said that, that stood out to me was how, you know, a lot of people say that um, you need to separate your work life from your home life, you know, leave any problems that you have at, at at home, leave them at the door when you walk in the office, you know, and how ridiculous that is, you know, how we're all human beings. Yes. And, you know, some may have a, a greater ability to do that than others. But at the end of the day, you can't nor should you. And as an employer, it's, you know, as a leader, it's your responsibility to help your employees, you know, feel whole, whether it's in their work life or their home life. And as people do get to listen to it, if they have thoughts or feedback, they may actually get to tell you in person because you have quite a bit of travel coming up, don't you? Yeah, so I'm going to be actually heading down to Panama City um, in the country of Panama, so not the Florida version of Panama, which was interesting. <laughs> Real you know, when Panama. I'm, yeah, when I'm looking for flights. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to be giving a keynote to one of the largest agencies uh, within the United Nations. So I'm really, really looking forward. I'm really proud to support that. So that's something that's going to be going on um, in a couple of weeks time. And then I'm going to be heading to Scottsdale, Arizona and to ProcureCon in direct West. So ProcureCon, they've got a great lineup this year. Um, a lot of high profile CPOs are going to be there. So I'm planning to record a number of podcasts to share with you all through the remainder of the year. And just a reminder, if you haven't booked your tickets, uh, shameless plug, you're able to get 25% <laughs> off through, uh, we have a code, 
um, for ProcureCon tickets. So just go to artofprocurement.com slash ProcureCon. Lists all their events in North America. You can use it against any of those events. But really looking forward to going down there and, say, recording a bunch of podcasts to share with listeners for the rest of the year. Um, and then finally, we're actually battening down the hatches here in Orlando. So um, we have, we're recording this on Thursday morning. We have Hurricane Dorian, who is heading our way. And just being new Floridians, this will be a first for us. We'll be uh, having a, a hurricane in our path. So I think it's supposed to be Category 2. And the forecast right now is that we're going to get a direct hit sometime on Sunday or on Monday, so about the time that this pod's going to be published. So I need to make sure that we get this edited and published long before there's any <laughs> risk to our power. Um, so I'm keeping our fingers crossed that it doesn't make it to land. But there's lots of different forecasting models that predict very different paths, but um, you know we're kind of getting ready for, I guess, if, uh, one of our... I, I, I guess it's a, a welcome to Florida initiation is uh, your <laughs> first like hurricane <laughs> right <laughs> so now yeah. all you can really do is stock up on snacks and stay safe yeah like i was saying earlier you know a week's supply of granola bars and <laughs> um you know f- uh, kids fruit snacks that i will take from them for the week and i'll be good <laughs> Well, I want to thank everybody for listening to us uh, on this month in procurement. Um, of course, I welcome you to reach out to us with any questions or comments you might have. We're always open, of course, to audience engagement. If there's any topics that you'd like us to cover, just let us know. And you can do that just by going, well, you can find us on social, but there's also a contact form at artprocurement.com slash contact to uh, get in touch with us. But until next month, Kelly, I want to thank you so much for, uh, uh, for joining me today and really enjoyed our chat. Thanks so much, Phil. Stay safe this weekend, everybody in Florida. All right. Thank you very much. And we'll uh, keep our fingers crossed. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Hi there. I want to thank you for tuning in to today's podcast. You can check out all of our back catalog at artofprocurement.com slash podcast, where you can also subscribe to our newsletter to make sure that you never miss an episode. And if you found value in today's show, I'd love if you would tell a peer or perhaps go and rate and review by going to artofprocurement.com slash review. Word of mouth really is the best way to help the podcast grow. And if you're able to do either one of those things, I would truly appreciate it. 